there is talk of a revival of Christianity, at least amongst some secular intellectuals. The historian Tom Holland is often referenced, or the former new atheist Ian Hershey Alley. But I wonder about this. It set me thinking, not so much in terms of the sociology, is this a significant cultural moment, but more of the spirituality. What kind of Christianity might be being discussed or revisited, or for those who seek a revival, promoted? I don't think it's really about a liberal or conservative divide. After all, the Christianities to which people might be turning can show up in liberal or conservative forms. Orthodoxy, for example, can be liberal or conservative, or similarly, evangelicalism. And also, liberalism, in the sense of being about individual choice, is what this kind of Christian turn might be about. But of course, it might be conservative in the form that the individual chooses, and therefore not liberal at the same time. Really, what draws me and what's set me thinking is the quality of the Christianity that might be being discussed. What feel does it have? What attitude is embedded within it? And to try and tease us apart, I turned particularly to a whole series of talks that the Oxford inkling Owen Barfield gave on his great friend C.S. Lewis, particularly after Lewis died in 1963. It felt apposite not only because there were differences between these two oppositional friends, as Lewis once called it, but also because Lewis himself is often cited as a kind of touchstone, almost a purveyor of the truth that culture might turn on, and so is an interesting interlocutor in this present moment, if 50 years on from his death. And Barfield himself said that whilst the two had much in common, of course, they also differed. And he characterised the difference in this way. He said that Lewis was more atomistic in his approach. And by that, Barfield meant that he borrowed from the spirit of the times, particularly the spirit of truth that sought in science, the value of evidence, the value of making distinctions, hence the notion of atomizing, of consistency that's internal, to that which is being purported, authenticity of belief, presence of mind, which is so strong in C.S. Lewis. That is how Barfield characterised Lewis's approach. Whereas for Barfield, rather than atomization being important, flow was perhaps one way of capturing his attitude, his sense. This is drawing on from romantic traditions about the value of connection, that there are differences, but they are without distinction. So they coexist in order to expand rather than coexist in order to cancel one or the other out. Consistency, similarly, rather than being a sign of truth, is is equally likely to be a kind of trap because it mistakes the territory and the map. But also Barfield wanted romanticism to come of age. He felt that pure Romanticism in the sense of a kind of longing, a yearning, an expression of loss isn't adequate. And so he also valued Lewis tremendously and the atomistic approach because it almost challenged romanticism flow. So in that romantic spirit that there can be distinctions without absolute differences, but the distinctions works made it worth making because they open up possibility. I've highlighted maybe a dozen differences that Barfield discussed between him and Lewis, and I felt they in some way map onto this so-called revival in our times. And the first one has to do with the basic sense of the Christian story that's been 
told. And on the Lewis side, if you like, the atomistic side, is the sense that there's a fundamental chasm between the creator and the creature. So the fundamental Christian story is one of rescue from death or the need for Jesus to substitute in our place, substitutionary theories of atonement, so-called. Or they often have an ethical feel, this too, like there's a law of right and wrong, as Lewis puts it, in mere Christianity. And so making the right choice is really important. Divine transcendence is also stressed. God is wholly other, though bridged by Jesus, and that's the significance of the incarnation. And sinfulness is comparatively described as a kind of disobedience, being on the wrong side of that gulf. And so feeling bad, feeling guilty is appropriate. And conversely, obeying following the right way, trying to discern the law of right of ro right and wrong and bring it into your life. Discipleship is the way the Christian life is described. And that differs from the flow, more romantic sense, where participation in the life of the creator, even as a creature, would be stressed. So there's no chasm, and the significance of Jesus is about awakening or realizing that truth rather than about rescue or substitution. God is still seen as transcendent, but that transcendence can be known imminently within the depths of the soul rather than as an absolute metaphysical otherness. And so the significance of the incarnation is bringing that consciousness to our minds, an incarnation that happens here and now, in the depths of our soul, quite as much as it happened in a historical life 2,000 years ago. Sin, therefore, is not really about disobedience, but is about the failure to be truly free, which is about the alignment of our life with God's life, about the realisation in our consciousness of the divine awareness. And so is a kind of breach of trust, almost, between the creature and the creator. And so returning to that co-creation in life is the remedy for sin. There's no price to be paid, but more there's a trust to be restored through an awareness. So that's the first difference that Barfield spotted in Lewis, the sort of chasm account of the Christian story as opposed to the participative account of the Christian story. And it leads on to other things. So, for example, in the Lewis atomistic kind of Christianity, the goal is salvation. And there is the real prospect of eternal damnation without salvation. The kingdom, if you like, will come and it'll be all wrapped up at the last judgment, seen at some future point when history comes to an end. Whereas for the flow Barfield approach, really it's about potential rather than goals, the potential for this participation now. And also all will be saved, not only all human beings, but all creatures, the whole of reality will be saved. And this is expressed in Jesus' remarks that the kingdom of God is within you, the kingdom is near, and the judgment comes about when the truth of that strikes us, and so the turning of the minds, the metanoia, the realignment of the heart is prompted. Again, a rather different way of thinking about Christianity rather than salvation. It's this notion of potential and participation. Similarly, you get differences, therefore, in the way that Jesus is talked about. In the Lewis stroke atomistic approach, Jesus is talked about mostly in personal terms, the individual matters. That's another reflection of this word atom. It's about personal relationship, personal transformation. And so it focuses more as well on the human rather than the wider world, creation as a whole. And therefore, it feels like ecological concerns are harder to bring into this approach. They're presented as a kind of ethical demand. We must treat creation aright. 
and it's talked about in terms that are quite managerial, husbandry. Human responsibility is to manage the creation well. Whereas that's very different, I think, in the flow, more romantic approach where Jesus can be talked about equally in cosmic terms as the Christ, as the Logos, as the allure that pulses through all things as well as through the individual. And so all things can align with that. And hence, in myth, in the stories of the saints, you get holy places and holy planets, holy plants and holy animals, as well as holy people, for all created things can reflect God. Dante talks about this, for example, the qualities of the different planetary lights echo with various aspects of the divine light. And so by contemplating the planetary lights, that holy light is instilled more fully in us. So ecology is seen in this romantic view as part of our awakening, our realisation, rather than as something that human beings must manage or respond to in a more straightforwardly ethical way. Christianity as a whole then can feel very different. There's an exclusive quality in the Lewis stroke atomistic way. It's a complete story unto itself and it must really be the best form of the many religions of the world, um, the most complete, um, the most full, um, perhaps because it's actually historical. It makes historical claims, not just mythological or theological claims, perhaps because it most squarely acknowledges the fallenness of humanity, this sense of sin and separation, um, perhaps because the Trinitarian conception of God is seen to be the most metaphysically complete notion of unity. Threeness in oneness is much richer than just pure monadism. And similarly, as Barfield puts it, there's a kind of solidity in Lewis's writings, and he's very clear about what he's against as well as what he's for. Heresies, for example, must be challenged as wrong. Whereas in the romantic, more flow approach, Christianity is porous. It's a way of approaching the whole, a way of being able to engage with difference because they're really nuances of distinction. So Christ's light is seen in all lights, one way or another. And all lights are as many expressions of the one divine light and will illuminate our sense of the divine light when we pay attention to other traditions, to other revelations. There's a sense of different traditions being interfused or maybe fractal. So, you know, heresies and other traditions might reveal more clearly aspects which are missed within Christianity. They may help one to see the truth more clearly because they all feed into this one truth. That might be in terms of practice, learning a meditative practice in a Buddhist tradition, say, um, as well as a sense of the metaphysics of truth. When it comes to truth, the atomistic Lewis approach puts a stress on proving um, reason and proof, evidential proof, brings intellectual sight, as Lewis called it in his poem entitled Reason. And so, for example, the resurrection of Jesus is sought as a historical fact, and the Bible is read as providing the evidence in support of that fact, along with other circumstantial evidence, such as the revival of the disciples after the crucifixion. But what's also interesting about this notion of truth and proof and evidence is that it's likely to produce change in the individual concerns, considering the proof, the evidence. And in fact, of course, Lewis himself famously changes from a kind of absolute subjective idealism through to a version of theism and then finally Christianity itself. Whereas Barfield always used to say that he didn't change much in life. He had a perception of things and then wrote about it in different ways. And this is because truth is known not primarily as that which is proven, but 
that which is intuitively perceived. So reason can bring intellectual sight, for sure, but then that reason highlights a new horizon over which the imagination and love can move. It might even bring in a new kind of rationality and so expand the consciousness of the individual rather than secure the consciousness of the individual. So the resurrection, for example, it's recognised that the biblical accounts of the recognition are really very different. Some, Jesus appears more as a kind of ghost walking through walls. Sometimes the solidity of Christ is stressed when Christ eats the fish, for example. And this isn't an inconsistency. This is seen as distinctions that point to a mystical fact and intuitively understanding, receiving through the imagination that sense of what resurrection might be becomes the important move. This is a notion of resurrection that pervades all things when seen in manifest ways. And this is why the romantic Barfield flow approach is less likely to change actually, because it's anchored in what's ultimately ineffable. You might put it another way and say promiscuity is baked into this because this ineffable, intuitive sense of what's true is likely therefore to find reflections in all sorts of different traditions and places. And so we love and enjoy that difference rather than feeling as the Lewis approach might be that that difference has somehow got to be reconciled and drawn back into the one exclusive account of Christianity. Again, I hope you can perhaps feel that these differences have been played out in the different voices speaking about the renewal of Christianity now. What attitude, what quality of Christianity is being discussed is a good question to ask. To continue, the head, I think, matters in the Lewis approach in a certain kind of Christianity being discussed now. Um, love is ignited by understanding the Eureka moment. Conversion is perceived as a moment rather than as a process. And similarly, the revelation of the Christian truth, the incarnation of Jesus, are understood to have been that which has been revealed, that which has been incarnated. And so becoming convicted is a central spirit of this approach to Christianity. Whereas for the flow, for the romantic approach, the heart or intuitive knowledge matters more. Love leads the intellect, not fires the intellect. So conversion is more likely to be a process than a moment. But even when there are moments of realisation, what's immediately recognised is that they're just catalysts or seeds for the ongoing process of conversion of mind, of consciousness, of heart. And similarly, revelation and incarnation, therefore, is seen as ongoing now. We know of that revelation and incarnation that's ongoing because of the moment of incarnation and revelation that Christianity remembers. But it's to remind us of that ongoing process. Personal relationship with God is therefore seen as unfolding. It's about engaging or seeing more. And also in relation to the spirit of the times, understanding how the spirit of the times, for all that they might be felt to be misguided and fallen, are still part of this ongoing revelation of God. And so trying to understand the times as what they might offer, rather than judging the times as going wholly off the way in the law of right and wrong, picking the wrong, and so being against, maybe more reactionary to the times. That would be the more atomistic Lewis approach, which I think you can feel quite strongly in the discussion of Christianity now. How do these voices speaking about Christianity now relate to our times? Do they see them as going wrong in the sense of needing to be radically corrected, lest everything fail? Or is there something in what no doubt is going wrong, is ignorant, that is still valuable and necessary, maybe the value of the individual, the sense that that which becomes dark is 
prior to the rediscovery of that which is light. Or maybe it's about exclusive Christianity having failed. And so a porous Christianity needed to be discovered, but through the failure of that exclusive Christianity. Atomistic Lewis approach, more like to be impressed by quantities and facts. So hence this interest in revival, is it really happening or not? That somehow feels related to the truth of Christianity. And if there isn't a revival, that would be quite a blow. Whereas for the romantic approach, it's much more about qualities and energies, trying to follow that unfolding of the spirit in whatever is around, understanding the poem of now, if you like. Um, And it may not even be understandable. There may be darkness But the value of that is still to let that work on you, trusting that that is also the work of the Spirit because it might be preparing the ground, because it might be encouraging you to let go of that which you had rather held onto too tightly in order that a new horizon might reveal itself, a new step for the imagination might be made. When it comes to the relationship between the two sides, um, The Lewis atomistic approach is going to be wary of the romantic of the flow, feeling it's mushy, feeling that the imagination is likely to be deluded as revelatory, believing that the disbelief of our times is implicated in that mushiness, is about being able to stand up for that which is true, um, relativism, reductionism, postmodernism and so on. It'll acknowledge that the imagination is valuable, but it must be constrained, it must be judged by reason, by proof, by evidence. Whereas the romantic approach appreciates the atomistic perspective, um, partly because it helps discern the imagination. Imagination of itself is not enough because then it slips into what Barfield following Coleridge called mere fancy. And also because there's a sense for the romantic approach that the infinite presence of God needs to be made finite in our particular lives. Mortality can find a place in immortality when it has a place to live. Time is the moving image of eternity for sure, but we must be in our time in order that the eternity can shine through in our time. And so reason and the atomistic approach can help establish ground that revelation of the divine. But on the other hand, it also fears too reductive an approach. Um, The exclusive Christianity is implicated in the disbelief of our times because it's become too contracted. And so therefore there must be an asymmetric relationship between the flow and the atomistic approach, that the flow needs the atomistic approach in order to discern itself, but is prior. Whereas the atomistic approach would think of it the other way around, that imagination can illuminate the truths that it knows, but it mustn't usurp the place of that truth. So this, I think, is why Lewis often reads allegorically rather than mythologically. Um, He uses the imagination to illustrate his truths rather than inviting his imagination to actually change his thoughts and perception. He said, I think, that it's models that matter. Um, And he also valued the imagination because it's actually free of what's real. It's kind of a respite from the struggle to know what's true. That's why books of fantasy are pleasurable for him. And Barfield felt that Lewis believed that if the imagination actually came in too much contact with reality, it would be spoiled. Fiction should be a kind of escape that then helps us return to the struggle to know what's really true. You might say that imagination is a resource for reason, and reason is always going to be the arbiter. Whereas for the romantic, for the flow approach, for this alternative sense of Christianity now. It prefers myth because myth expands our consciousness and so makes us ready for the reception of higher dimensions so that 
our perceptions themselves can change and therefore the nature of the world itself might change as well. You have this when you read Tolkien, I think. You immediately feel the difference between Tolkien and Lewis. Tolkien isn't about illustrating Christian truth. Tolkien is about expanding the imagination so that Christian truth might become all the more vivid as a result of engaging with the story of the Hobbit. Imagination, therefore, is higher than reason, and different kinds of rationality might follow in its wake. It's about how we see the world, but also the world that we actually see. Myth might help us to see more, hence Tolkien's interest in fairy stories, wanting to hold open that in-between space represented by the language of fairy. And it's not a, an escape from what's real, a, real a, a sort of break, a rest, but it's an opening onto what's real. Fiction, if you like, can educate the mind, not in the sense of telling it truths, but in the sense of expanding the very notion of the mind in order that more might be perceived. You see this in accounts of the resurrection as well. Again, I think that a couple of examples, Lewis once said that Christianity is a statue that needs to be brought to life by showing that it's true. Whereas the romantic approach might say that Christianity is the very bringing to life of a statue. Conversely, Lewis famously remarked that the Narnia stories began when he once saw the image of a fawn walking under a lamppost carrying an umbrella. Now there's a mix of worlds there. There's the fawn, there's the umbrella, there's the lamppost. And that's a pleasurable fantasy. Whereas the romantic approach might see no, as, Lewis, as uh, William Blake did, um, I saw a fairy funeral, and that extraordinary perception is an awareness that there are other worlds that are also here. So I think the romantic approach is going to be more open, therefore, to that which extends our sense of reality from intuitions, but also following the energy, following the spirit, without necessarily knowing where that leads. But then also on occasion, the supernatural, even fearful experiences, can be welcomed as part of the sense of engaging with God, with Christianity. Putting it differently again, simplicity, you might say for Lewis, is about clarity. This presence of mind that you get in his writing, his acute critique. For example, he will say, it cannot be true that all truths are relative, because you're smuggling in there the one truth that's not relative, the supposed truth that truths are relative. And there's something very valuable in that clarity. I think that's why a lot of people find him such a relief to read. They feel they've been given a kind of cognitive perception that they can hold on to. That's the value of the clarity notion of simplicity in his writing. Whereas simplicity for the romantic is much more about touching the essence of things, an awareness of what's conveyed in the feeling of a phrase or is at the edge of words. To quote William Blake again in his wonderful aphorisms that carry this alternative notion of simplicity, he talks at one point about the ruins of time building mansions in eternity. The ruins of time build mansions in eternity. Now quite what that means is hard to say, but there's a simplicity to the phrase that enables you to feel you're being given something that you could contemplate, maybe for a lifetime, and it would continue leading you into the essence of things. That's the simplicity that the romantic values. The sense of having participated in more. The Lewis approach, which I think is why it's valued so much now, has great strengths. It's against reductionism, it's against subjectivism, it's against the idols of the age, and shows why they're idols so clearly. You know, the abolition of man is often cited as Lewis's great work in this respect, that he showed that sublimity, that the feeling of the sublime, can't just be a personal feeling, as he puts it in the book when someone's looking at a waterfall, but the sublimity must be in the waterfall itself. Otherwise, you get a collapse of meaning. Everything becomes purely subjective, and that leads to a collapse of our humanity, because our humanity is about attending and becoming conscious of the meaning in all things, not 
about privatising meaning. Whereas I think that the flow, romantic approach, would be against an imaginationless approach to life. It would see the purely rational as unable to touch the soul. And so you get this sense that whilst more and more is known about the world in a factual sense, as Barfield puts it, that very accumulation seems to denude the world of meaning as the facts accumulate. The machine mentality takes over, and that is what leads to the abolition of humanity. So their intention in this way as well um, is the reductionism to be fought by fact, or is it actually the pursuit of fact which prompts the reductionism, you might say. Lewis famously talked about joy, but in a nuanced way. And the nuance was that it's the very appreciation of the dialectic of desire, that which is longed for and never fully owned, being itself the joy, because that longing is the fulfillment of what's really a longing for God, the source of all things, you might say, not for one particular thing or person um, as an object, joy as the sense of longing itself. Whereas I think for the more romantic approach, joy is knowing how the finite, the mortal, the transient is part of the infinite, part of the eternity. Blake again immediately comes to mind, knowing a world in a grain of sand. And so settling into that perceptual transformation, the annihilation of the self, as Blake puts it, because in the sense that the self is not separate, not apart, but is a portal to, into that whole, into that oneness. This then takes us a bit more deeply into the imagination and what Barfield talked a lot about as polarity. Now he felt that Lewis didn't understand polarity in Coleridge's sense. And for Coleridge, polarities are differences that, with the tension between them, lead to or precipitate, catalyze a sense of more. And so the polarities must be held onto. Um, it's a Trinitarian sense of life, with the Trinity not just being a description of the divine, but of the nature of reality as a whole. Because, for example, when I encounter another person, Friendship is not hoping to bridge the divide, but is actually recognising that in the bringing together of two others, a shared third presence might become possible, which is held open for the friends by their difference as much as by their coming together. Whereas I think for Lewis, oppositions were about choice, that there is good, there is evil, and good must be opted for. His great book, the Great Divorce um, was deliberately wrote and again, written against William Blake, um, who had, of course, written a book called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, whereas Lewis said, no, we must be completely aware of the difference between heaven and hell and choose heaven, choose the good, and discard hell, discard the bad, lest we fail to reach heaven. That's one of the great messages of The, the Great Divorce. Differences therefore disappear as the truth is realised. Whereas the romantic approach with this polarity is somehow there is something of God even in what seems evil and the realisation, the participation can bring that to light. The logic would be that if God weren't in that which is deemed evil and indeed is evil, the evil would disappear already because it wouldn't have existence. And therefore, the task is to realise what has, is ignorant in the evil, bad position, or even what's become deeply perverse. But at the same time, as Blake puts it, the infernal can stir up a kind of complacent attitude to that which is deemed heavenly or good. And so it might bring life to the heavenly. Um, angels in Blake are sometimes complacent creatures, whereas the devils are the ones which agitated and so can therefore stir things up for us now too. Polarity, the
the Trinitarian approach is, is really quite a fundamental, subtle difference between Lewis and Barfield. And again, I think you find it now in this revival. Is there a desire to, for clarity, to sort things out, to say that which is good and that which is bad and opt for that which is good? Or is there a capacity to settle into the myriad forms, the melange of now, the, the hubbub, the mushiness even, and to want to do the patient work of seeing how those distinctions can bring us all into a richer, fuller version of reality, valuing that which is other patiently, not so as to be absorbed by it, but so as not to be reactive against it, knowing that that which maybe doesn't seem part of the Christian tradition, nonetheless might have something to speak to it. Time, the experience of time is another reflection of this. You know, the present moment is seen as a moment of choice for Lewis, an absolutely unavoidable either or, Lewis puts it, presents itself. And perhaps the biblical images that he would appeal to, therefore, would be the separation of the sheep from the goats or Jesus saying, he who is not for me is against me. Whereas the romantic perception would say, no, time is the moment of communion with now. There are no absolute either ors. And the biblical parable that would come to mind would be the wheat and the tares. And Jesus saying, no, the wheat must be allowed to grow with the tares, lest you pull out the wheat. And as commentaries on the parable suggests, such as the one given by St. Augustine, how do we even know the difference between the wheat and the tares from this point of view? Everything must grow and everything, therefore, will, in the fullness of time, be seen to be part of the divine kingdom. And again, whilst Jesus at one point did say, he who is not for me is against me, he also said, he who is not against us is with us. So we we'll point to that experience of truth. When it comes to culture wars, I think that the Lewis tradition would be more like to be in the thick of it and be wanting to fight for its corner, feeling that certain moments, certain decisions, certain secular issues, a lot stands on them. And if you choose wrongly, then you're choosing erroneously. Hierarchies and structures will matter too. Worldly manifestations of the divine, because they'd be seen as reflections in creation of the way that God created things. So part of the divine order. And therefore, the culture wars are part of the fight that Christians must engage now. Whereas I think that the romantic approach would see things slightly differently, recognising that issues are at stake in the culture wars, of course, but at least partly standing back in order to try to understand deeply what's at stake. It's this sense that Jesus had of being in the world, but not of the world, and getting that balance being really crucial. It's not a quietism, because Jesus, of course, disturbed the authorities quite as much as the outer night zealots and rebels of the time. Um, partly because it calls into question the very premises of the culture war, saying, no, there's more, render to Caesar, but are we rendering to gods? And then that more expansive opening of the flatland of now, that's going to be challenging, going to be dismissed, but also be unsettling. That will be the role that the romantic approach would play in now. And I think you see that in these different kinds of Christianity as well. Is Christianity being used as a weapon to re-engage the culture wars? Or is Christianity being used as a possible way beyond the culture wars, a transcendent perspective within which everything becomes relativized and so therefore eased? Finally, when it comes to the future of Christianity, the future for the Lewis approach would be dependent upon a successful revival so that the Christian story returns as the story of civilization. And if it doesn't do that, then not only is it bad for the civilization, but it causes a sense of unease about the truth of Christianity itself. Whereas I think that the Barfield romantic tendency that I think you can see now, and as will be clear is the side that I align with, sees that the future of Christianity depends upon the emergence of the intuitive ways of knowing that it 
remembers, that it transmits to us. What now is often taken on trust, you might say, almost as a kind of fideistic belief in a very secular world, can be the catalyst, the prompt that causes a slow, steady conversion of consciousness and evolution of consciousness in order that more can be known. Not just reason showing Christianity, but the very notion of rationality changing. Not just a conversion in a moment, but a participation that's an ongoing process. Not time as in choice, but time as a moment of communion that can expand, that can grow. Not sin as disobedience and failure, but sin as a falling short, a loss of freedom, and freedom being the alignment in that greater life which is God. In these ways, I think you can discern the quality of Christianity that's being discussed now, as it was discussed 50 years ago, particularly through Barfield and Lewis's discussion about these things.